my dad is a cattle farmer. We have like 180 acres, and I'm just wondering what like the step is. Like, how do I help? You know what I mean? Like, what do you do for someone who's like <laughs> my family's farm like over 50 years? What do you? And I, I'm not. I'm like not against this. I'm a vegetarian. Right. I try and right. tell them, but it's all right. No, I mean it's a it's a valid question. Yeah, can you ever, did everybody hear that? Um, yes, yeah, so there are a couple couple different ways to look at that. Okay. First of all, you know that um, Drs. Esselstyn and T. Colin Campbell, they, they grew up on, on actually dairy farms. Um, but see, that's, that's this plunge thing we're talking about. They became more aware, so they, they moved themselves out of it. Now, what, what you do if you're asking for advice for, <laughs> for on a family basis, you know what to do. They're most likely buried in all of these cultural influences. So you'd first of all have to you know, direct them to like my book and say, you know, just please read this a little bit and get them to the level where they can at least uh, have your foot in the door to understand that maybe their land could be used for something else. That's the first step. But, you know, I would say out of all the places that I've, that I've visited, uh, I, I, would, I would think the, the, the most difficult uh, locations or farms that I visited in terms of the masking, the veils, that I, have to, that I would think would have to be peeled off to get them into a position to understand really what we're talking about here and how to use their land more efficiently uh, or effectively or more healthy in a healthier way are the dairy farmers. So that's close to what you're talking about. But you know, when I sit and look at a dairy farmer, I look at the first thing they tell me is, you know, they're the fifth generation or fourth generation or third generation dairy farmer and how proud they are to be that. And they don't really have a clue to what they're doing. And right next door to them, you can see how land is being used incredibly efficiently. And they don't have all the pollution. They don't have, you know, they're not creating a food that's unhealthy for everybody to eat. They're not creating a food that, or their food product that creates all this global depletion. But they have just this myriad of all these influences. So if you're close enough, you can drop the book in their lap and just say, you know, just take a peek at this and then get them to the point where they can at least talk about, I mean, there are many, many avenues they could go once they decided to change the farm operations to something else. <laughs> and it'll help actually in the next two to three years with the way the farm bill is going to be revamped. Uh, I don't know where they sit right now with subsidies, but without subsidies, uh, most of our meat and dairy operations wouldn't, wouldn't be in, the, in such high demand as they are now. So it, it'll help. I mean, instead of being a subspecialty, it's actually called a specialty crop right now for anybody that produces uh, fruits and vegetables. Actually, our subsidies right now, uh, all the government subsidies combined, uh, less than 1.5% less than are, are being placed out for, uh, for vegetables. In California, they have a $35 billion uh, revenues from agriculture. Over 50% of that is from, is from, are from vegetables and fruit, and yet they receive less than 5% of all of the, all the money going into, into their agriculture. So you can see how skewed it is. So it, it just keeps promoting you know, meat and dairy products. So let them know that you know, hopefully there'll be, there'll be increased demand in the future for uh, fruit and vegetable products, and, and get the book to them. Let them read that. Does that help? Okay. <laughs>